And good evening, and thank you for allowing us this opportunity to provide input on such a profoundly important subject. I appear today on behalf of the Coalition for Health Care and Conscience. Joining me is Larry Worth, the Executive Director of the Christian Medical and Dental Society of Canada. We are like-minded organizations committed to protecting conscience rights for health practitioners and facilities. In addition to the Catholic Archdiocese of Toronto and the Christian Medical and Dental Society of Canada, our members also include the Catholic Organization for Life and Family, the Canadian Federation of Catholic Physician Societies, the Canadian Catholic Bioethics Institute, and Canadian Physicians for Life. I will address two issues, conscience protection for health care workers and palliative care and support services for the vulnerable. For centuries, faith-based organizations and communities have cared for the most vulnerable in our country, and they do so to this day. We know what it is to journey with those who are facing great suffering in mind and body, and we are committed to serving them with a compassionate love that is rooted in faith and expressed through the best medical care available. We were brought together by a common mission, to respect the sanctity of human life, which is a gift of God, to protect the vulnerable, and to promote the ability of individuals and institutions to provide health care without being forced to compromise their moral convictions. It is because of this mission that we cannot support or condone assisted suicide or euthanasia. The dust returns to the earth as it once was, and the life breath returns to the God who gave it. Death comes to us all, and so patients are fully justified in refusing burdensome and disproportionate treatment that only prolongs the inevitable process of dying. But there is an absolute difference between dying and being killed it is our moral conviction that it is never justified for a physician to help take a patient's life under any circumstances. Those called to the noble vocation of healing will instead be engaged in killing, with a grievous effect both upon the integrity of a medical profession committed to do no harm and upon the trust of patients and those from whom they seek healing. Even those doctors who support this legalization in principle may be uneasy when they experience its far-reaching implications. The strong message from the Supreme Court is unmistakable. Some lives are just not worth living. We passionately disagree. In light of all this, it is clear that reasonable people with or without religious faith can have a well-founded moral conviction in their conscience that prevents them from becoming engaged in any way in the provision of assisted suicide and euthanasia. They deserve to be respected. It is essential that the government ensure that effective conscience protection is given to health care providers, both institutions and individuals. They should not be forced to perform actions that go against their conscience or to refer the action to others, since that is the moral equivalent of participating in the act itself. It's simply not right or just to say, you do not have to do what is against your conscience, but you have to be sure it happens. Through increased access to palliative care, disability, chronic disease and mental health services, Canada can significantly reduce the number of people who see death as the only viable option to end their isolation, their feeling of being a burden and their sense of worthlessness. Our concern for our patients extends to our concern for conscience protection. Recently, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario passed a policy requiring referral for assisted death. A referral is the recommendation or a handing over of care to another doctor on the advice of the referring physician. The requirement to refer forces our members to act against their moral conviction that assisted suicide or euthanasia will in fact harm their patients. If they refuse to refer, they will risk disciplinary action by the Ontario College. When a proposed practice calls into question such a foundational value of the common good of society and the foundational value of the very meaning of a profession, a healthcare worker has the right to object. A healthcare worker does not lose their right to moral integrity just because they choose a particular profession. In the landmark Carter case, the Supreme Court of Canada said that no physician could be forced to participate in assisted death. They also said that this was a matter that engaged the charter freedoms of conscience and religion. It is not in the public interest to discriminate against a category of people based upon their moral convictions 
and religious beliefs. This does not create a more tolerant, inclusive, or pluralistic society, and it is ironic that this is being done all in the name of choice. Fortunately, six other colleges have not required referral. We have enumerated several possible options for the federal government to ensure that these charter rights are respected all across the country. We have a legal opinion that we will make available to the committee uh, that lists five ways that the federal government could protect conscience rights. If the federal government does not act, then we risk a patchwork quilt of regulatory practices and a serious injustice being done to some very conscientious, committed, and capable doctors. Despite our concerns, members of our coalition will not obstruct the patient's decision should this legislation be put in place. The federal government could establish a mechanism allowing patients direct access to a third-party information and referral service that would provide them with an assessment once they have discussed assisted death with their own doctor and clearly decided they wish to seek it. Our members do not wish to abandon their patients in their most challenging moments of vulnerability and illness. When we get a request for assisted death, should this legislation go ahead, we'll probe to determine the underlying reason for the request to see if there are alternatives for management. We'll provide complete information about all available medical options, including assisted death. However, our members must step away from the process, allowing the patient to seek the assessment directly once they have a firm commitment to take that path. Like our coalition, the Canadian Medical Association has stated that doctors should not be required to do referrals for assisted suicide or euthanasia. It's important to remind the committee that no other foreign ju jurisdiction requires physician compliance in assisted death through referral. In closing, we highlight four areas of serious concern. The need for improved patient services, including, including palliative, mental health care, and support for people with disabilities. Protection of the vulnerable. Provisions that physicians, nurses, and other health care professionals not be required to refer for or perform assisted death or be discriminated against because of their moral convictions. And finally, protection for health care facilities like hospitals, nursing homes, and hospices who are unable to provide assisted death on their premises because of their organizational values. I would simply say that there are many, many Canadians, especially those most deeply, intimately involved in caring for people, who are profoundly troubled by our country moving in this direction. And that whatever procedures are, you are in the course of setting up, that those who have that profound conviction uh, must be, I think their, their conscience needs to be protected. And I'm glad the Unitarian Church also agrees with that. I think not only individuals, but also institutions. There, is, there are ways of providing uh, protection for conscience and um, dealing with this issue, and I think Larry has uh, mentioned that, and I want to give more detail on that. Yes, the proposal uh, which we will leave behind was one that we discussed at, at, at length with the Canadian Medical Association, which they have approved, which basically uh, has the, shows the physician uh, uh, articulating their conscience uh, issue around assisted suicide and euthanasia with the patient, having the dialogue and discussion with the patient, giving the patient information about all uh, viable options, uh, but then uh, simply stepping back from the process and allowing the patient to have direct access to, uh, to an assessment for assisted death. Our hope would be that the, either the federal government or the provincial governments would create an information and referral service so that after patients have had the discussion with their own doctor, that they are able to access that directly. We've checked that out with moral theologians, both on the evangelical and, and Roman Catholic side, and they find that morally acceptable. This seems to us to be a way for our physicians to continue to care for the patient, not affect the physician-patient relationship, uh, and also uh, allow the patient to make their decisions without uh, there being any um, obstruction from the physician. So, so you would um, be open to this duty to inform then, if, if not an active referral, but to inform another body 
that the patient has requested uh, physician-assisted suicide. We differ slightly from the recommendations of the uh, 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 Provincial Territorial uh, Expert Advisory Group. Uh, they uh, suggested that it would be the physician's responsibility to inform the third party. Uh, our feeling is that uh, it would be uh, it would be unacceptable for us to have to take that responsibility, and that the uh, actual patient could uh, be the one to contact. In the, in the situation where the patient is unable to contact, which would normally happen in an institution, then we could look to a patient transfer that would be the opportunity then for another physician in the facility to be able to respond to the patient's concerns. Thank you. Mr. Warwa. <laughs> Thank you to the witnesses for being here. Uh, very interesting. Um, I, I uh, researched the Unitarian Council and I didn't see any hospitals that have been uh, established in the Unitarian Church, but I, I did uh, find many, many that are faith-based uh, Catholic hospitals. Um, there has, and I appreciate uh, the question from MP Shanahan um, and her sharing that we should not impose our, our beliefs on other Canadians. Uh, but there's this balance of faith in doing what's right uh, in our own hearts too. My question is, and also there's been comment around this table, that um, the doctor's uh, conscience uh, should be protected, um, and uh, maybe not to do it themselves, but to refer. And I'm understanding that uh, you believe, uh, and I've heard from most physicians, actually I think it was 70% of physicians do not want to have to be required to refer. 30%, uh, which is 24,000 physicians, are willing to uh, practice this. So focusing on the 70%, um, th that I think most Canadians believe that they should not be forced to perform uh, assisted suicide or euthanasia. They should not be forced to refer. But there's been a question, um, I think, from, um, from one of our senators that, that institutions, uh, BRICS, do not have conscience. If you could comment, um, do, do institutions have a, a, a value system that would say yes or no? Um, should they have the right to say no as an institution? Um, and is there a possibility of having possibly a uh, um, harmonizing system where you have institutions, hospitals, like a Catholic hospital, that is not bound because they're providing health care, but they could be known for uh, a hospital that provides health and natural death, and there could be some hospitals that provide that other uh, choice. Could you, uh, could you comment on that? I think it's very true to say that institutions are not uh, bricks and mortar. You don't look around and say this is, uh, institutions are made of people. Institutions are like the Sisters of St. Joseph, the, uh, the Grey Nuns, the, uh, of all the various groups who brought health, loving health care to this place. They're not things, they're communities of people. And they have values. That's why people come to them. That's why they seek them out. They, they know when they go to, for example, a, a hospital, like I think of, uh, say, Michael's Hospital, St. Joseph's Hospital, Providence Centre, which has a wonderful palliative care place. They know they can trust when they come to the Sisters, when they come to the, the church. And it's true as well for Jewish and uh, Protestant and uh, similar institutions, of which there are many, in my own diocese there are very many, uh, that they can trust that we have certain values that we hold to. Those values are important for our whole society. Uh, I mean, political parties have values, other institutions have values. They're not objective things, they're not like material things, and that's a great value for our whole community. Um, these institutions are funded by the government because they do an immense good work. Uh, they provide uh, variety, diversity, choice, I might say, to people. And that's very, very important. So I would say that institutions provide the spirit. I think of the one next to where I live, the Urban Angel, St. Michael's. It's a sign of hope, hope for people. And if you, if you would undermine the institution for what it is, our society will be uh, very, very much uh, harmed. Our whole community would be a lot harsher, colder, crueler, without the witness given by communities of faith who are on the ground, on the street, day by day, caring for the most needy. I don't think they should be undermined or attacked. Any time? One minute. Um, Mr. Thank you, uh, um, Collins. Um, I, I'm just uh, wondering about the, um, the safeguards to ensure the conscience. You said you had some ideas of how Physicians that do not want to participate um, within a federal regime, I had heard that uh, one of the suggestions was that it could be a criminal offense to force someone 
a physician or an institution to force someone to be involved with this. Is this one of the suggestions that, uh, that you were considering? Yes, our, our legal brief has five different options in all. Uh, one of them would be, just as in some of the provincial college documents, uh, doctors uh, who choose to do euthanasia are protected against uh, discrimination uh, on the part of faith-based institutions. So also we would ask that doctors who uh, do not want to do euthanasia are also, are also protected. And that could be uh, by way of a uh, criminal statute that would make it unlawful for someone to be coerced to participating in this. Thank you. An institution. Thank you. Mr. Rankin. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to all of our so I particularly appreciate uh, uh, Cardinal Collins, your strong assertion of the need for our committee to address palliative care, and I really appreciate you putting that on the table. I wanted to, uh, I guess, explore a little bit what Mr. Wara was just saying, uh, presumably to Mr. Worthen, the question. Um, I'm going to read to you from the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, their interim guidance. They talk about physicians must provide an effective referral, quote, to a non-objecting, available and accessible physician or agency in a timely manner. And in my province of British Columbia, this similar body says, quote, physicians must ensure effective transfer of care for their patients. This is in the context of conscience protection for health care providers. Now, you've stated this obligation to refer patients would violate their conscience rights of certain physicians, and instead there should be a mechanism to provide patients with third-party information, assessment, and services. I'm a little concerned, though, because other witnesses have told us that simply providing um, a person who w wishes to exercise their constitutional right can't be limited by a Yellow Pages reference, an 800 number, or a website. So. I'm trying to get my head around what you're suggesting, and in particular, how that would affect the right of access, effective right of access for Canadians in remote communities, if one were to accede to your recommendation. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. It's a very good one. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, there needs to be more. Uh, our, our proposal is not to simply send someone to the Yellow Pages. Far from it. Our, our doctors are committed to the life and well-being of their patients. So they would want to maintain the physician-patient relationship. They would want to discuss this important decision with their patients. They would want to provide the patient, they would want to spend time determining what the reason for the request is, and they would also want to ensure that the patient uh, was able to uh, get uh, the assessment if they so desired it. They would not want to stand in the way of that. I'm not talking, we sh are, should not be talking in this country about having uh, a, a simple operator at the end of the phone that is going to give someone a number. We, in, in my view, we should be responding compassionately to these people because uh, these, me, most, many of these people will need services, support, and help. And so this, this service that is anticipated by the Canadian Medical Association, I think uh, similar in the, in the provincial territorial um, uh, expert advisory group recommendations, would be for support services to be made available and for this uh, person to get an appropriate uh, assessment and uh, in, in a thorough way. We're not talking about sending some of the yellow pages. This is in a thorough way. Now, I think that something like this is really important in a more remote community because even in a remote community you might have one doctor uh, or two doctors uh, both might be people who are not prepared to participate in assisted death this will mean that it would be important for that individual to be able to get access to this service and that service i think the responsibility is on government to ensure that that service is available and provided. Then I can, if in the time that's available, that's so short, um, I want to go to the institutional side. We've talked about the conscience of the health care provider. I'd like to turn again to the institutional argument and to quite, quite boldly put forward that if uh, an institution of which the Cardinal has spoken receives public funding, shouldn't they be required to provide all Canadians with the constitutional rights that they now have? I understand about the professional, 
and you've put some good arguments forward, but I'm still at a loss to understand why a, a body that receives public funding shouldn't be required to be providing constitutional rights that all Canadians now enjoy. Well, I, I would say, I would just to answer that quickly, uh, the, I, I would say that it's misreading the Carter decision to say that it would that it requires individual physicians or facilities to provide this service. What it says is that. Uh, people, Canadians have the right to this, but it doesn't say that they have a right to it from every uh, individual uh, institution or individual doctor. What if there's only one such institution in a remote northern Ontario community, for example? Well, this happens all the time in medical care. There are certain procedures that are only provided in certain places. It would be up to the, it's up to government. You know, the department, the departments of health cannot shirk their responsibilities here. If this is something that the Supreme Court has mandated, then the departments of health have to find ways to provide these services. And if, if that means that they have to send a physician out to that individual or bring that physician in, that's co that commonly happens. 